Hello, welcome to today's Friday Transportation Seminar. My name is Chris Munsier. I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering at Portland State University, and I'll be moderating today's seminar. Our Friday Transportation Seminars have been a tradition on the PSU campus since 2000. These seminars are usually held live on the Portland State University urban campus, but due to the pandemic, they're being held remotely. These seminars, um, sorry, Portland State University's urban campus is located on the ancestral lands of the Multnomah, Catlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watala bands of the Chinook and the Tualatin, Kalayapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous nation indigenous ancestors of this place. Remember these communities and honor their legacy lives and descendants. Today, we are very, very pleased to have Gabrielle Quiron Valderrama of the Portland Bureau of Transportation present on the urban freight system and its supporting infrastructure. Gabrielle served as the urban freight court, serves as the urban freight coordinator at the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Before joining PBOT, Gabriella worked as a post pre-doctoral research associate at the Supply Transportation and Logistics Center, contributing and leading novel research in the urban freight field. She directly collaborated with the lab's public and private sector partners to work on solving problems relevant to the urban goods delivery in the city of Seattle. These research efforts have resulted in the development of a new body of works, several publications in peer reviewed journals, city reports, and new city protocols for urban freight infrastructure design and management. Before jumping into today's seminar, I'd like to let you know about the last seminar we have for the academic quarter. So next uh, Friday, there is no seminar due to the um, Thanksgiving holiday. So our last seminar will be on Friday, December 3rd. Just as a quick overview of what you can expect today, uh, the speaker will speak for about uh, 35 to 40 minutes, followed by a QA. and uh, We will be receiving your questions through the Q&A dialogue on the Zoom panel. So down on the lower uh, part of your Zoom panel, you can type in questions in the Q&A box. And then uh, we will, myself and Professor uh, Liu will moderate the questions and ask them of the speaker. And if we run out of time for those questions, we will email them uh, to the speaker. The seminar does have closed captioning, so if you, but you need to enable it on the Zoom uh, control panel by turning on the CC feature. And if you are taking the seminar uh, for professional de development hours, this webinar is available for one hour of continuing education. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Gabriella. Thank you, Chris. Um, let me share my screen first. You should be able to see my screen, right? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, so excited to be here and thank you so much for the introduction, Chris, and also for track for the invitation to be here in today's seminar. Um, I'm a PG candidate at the University of Washington. Uh, so in the final stages of my PhD work and dissertation, and since July, I joined the Bureau, as Chris mentioned, um, and I'm the new Urban Freight Coordinator. So I'm really excited, uh, just moved to Portland and uh, we are working on the development of the new 2040 freight plan. So really exciting to be part of the team and using the knowledge I've been doing and um, um, creating through my PhD and my master's studies at UW. So um, today we're just gonna go first, we're gonna go to a background and then we're gonna talk a little bit of three sections of particularly my dissertation work and gonna finalize with conclusion and hopefully have a, an interesting discussion by the end. So just starting overall, we have a supply change, which is a set of notes and notes and links that tells the whole story of a whole journey of a product from the raw material to the production of the commercial goods to the final delivery. 
the supply chain, there are different configurations that can involve overseas movement and others may include just domestic and local flows. But it is a complex system that connects all the different types of facilities, stakeholders and transportation network. This section uh, that the supply chain is that we're gonna focus on today is called the last mile. And it's the section once these flows enter the city boundaries, within the city boundaries, um, it, that is either delivery into your local store and then you picking up that product into that store or when you get you hear the knock on your door from your UPS driver or other delivery drivers to get the, the, the package that you bought online. This part of the supply chain is actually the most expensive and time consuming section of the overall supply chain. And uh, for any city to be functional, it requires a constant flow of goods and service activities. And this system relies on the design, provision, and usage of adequate infrastructure to support these operations. In the last decades, the simplification, the growth of e-commerce and changing mobility ecosystem have amplified the challenge for commercial vehicles navigating through the city streets and searching for a place to park and unload. We have seen not only challenge for commercial vehicles, but also a change of how those logistics operation works and seeing an increase of those commercial vehicles into a local streets that didn't account for in their design. With increasing road capacity, unlikely to relieve traffic congestion, cities are under growing pressure to efficiently plan and manage both the infrastructure network supply mm -hmm. and the transportation demand. However, urban freight is often overlooked, or we think about freight because of the negative impacts that this system has. Think about noise, emission, congestion, etc. So when compared to passenger transport, both in the urban policy realm and the research space, it has historically paid little attention beyond its economic significance. When we plan with livable neighborhoods or sustainable, in fact, I will challenge you to go Google these terms and think, see the pictures. Uh, I will challenge you to find a truck or an urban delivery vehicle that is in those pictures because we don't automatically think associate freight with sustainability liability. And it's often an afterthought or excluded off together in the policy making efforts, which is really counterproductive as it's an essential component uh, for any city to function, as I mentioned before. In fact, when we think about freight planning in the US, there is a need for planning tools. Most of freight planning have been focusing more on the regional or state level rather into the municipality level. And many cities actually lack freight planning documents or they are limited in the assessment of freight. <clears throat> Just uh, focusing on the regional movement or in the movement between industrial district, districts or major facilities in their city boundaries, such as the ports or the airports or the railroads. Um, one study from my research lab found that only four cities had standalone documents closely to dedicated to the goods movement and who took a um, more comprehensive perspective of overall trade. All these documents, Portland being a pioneer in uh, freight planning documents uh, have been motivated with previous planning effort that expressed the need to better understand freight issues. When we think about the urban space, it's sometimes really hard to get data, really understanding of what's happening, because at the urban scale is challenging as the sector is fragmented and there are multiple stakeholders and high competition. Its operations are complex, changing and heterogeneous. When we think about middle or long range movements of freight, we think about really big heavy truck and that's what we associated because that's how those goods are moved. When we talk about the urban space, we have a very diverse commercial fleet from trailers to oversized vehicles to those little vans that are making that final delivery. Even now with the race of TNCs or on-demand services such as uh, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Amazon Prime, etc. At the same time, it's not only urban goods that are being delivered through this system, but we also have a different set of operations, including construction services, waste management, and reverse logistics. 
Um, moreover, the presence of interrupted traffic flow conditions and high relative density of access points to the urban street network makes it really complicated to really understand those origin destinations and what volumes that we are serving into what particular network element. All of these creates a challenge for the analysis, characterization, and classification of commercial traffic flow patterns. And this results in then in a lack of understanding of the logistics center of the logistics sector, particularly for many of the municipalities. In other words, it is very difficult to guide public action in the absence of detailed and precise data. And we know that in the last decade, there is a lot of changes in the logistics space. There is a seamless integration of Persian venues with social network and devices that allow any of us to access any product in the world just by clicking in our phone. So it takes us very little to access any color, any size that we want, and even compare within different companies. And also increasing the expectation of the customer um, about the availability of the product, how fast it gets delivered, when it gets delivered, and where it gets delivered. At the same time, we're seeing an increase of the urban population with a projection from the UN that by 2050, two thirds of the world population will be living in the urban areas. At the same time, again, we're seeing an important um, attention to meet sustainable goals, reduce emission for our cities. So how do we do that? Um, at the same time when we are not yet understanding this increase of e-commerce and the consolidation of the demand. So I, I guess the question is, what are we seeing in our streets? What are the consequences of these changes in urban logistics? And that's why we're seeing these pictures. The one on the left is from Europe, really narrow streets. A lot of vehicles trying to make the either service or final delivery into a very uh, narrow space that is not designed for those types of operations. Um, and then we're seeing, for example, in cities like New York, you not only have to park your vehicle, but you also you have to sort those packages exactly to what uh, a story is going, what customer is going. So there is a sorting and unload uh, process that needs to happen. So the streets and other areas in our urban and our own space are becoming like micro consolidation centers. And that's also what we're seeing inside of our buildings. When we see this influx in demand for packages that uh, many administ um, building administrators need to figure out what to do, how to divide that to the different tenants, and who also pays the price for that um, storage of products. Also, we are seeing this increase for the curb that forces, particularly for the urban freight movement, forces commercial drivers to either search for a vacant space, adding time to delivery route or park in unsuitable areas, negative impacting road capacity. Both of these behavior leads to congestion, safety issues, and conflict between modes. So, with my, uh, the research I've been doing, I've mostly been focusing on uh, the limited availability of policymakers and planners to evaluate and develop suitable strategies to improve urban freight operations and the supply of adequate infrastructure to support it. And this is uh, mostly due to this scarce of inadequate database for all the issues I discussed previously and the limited understanding of their urban freight operation patterns. So the research goal has, uh, sorry, the research has three main goals. One is building evidence-based knowledge on the urban freight, focusing on those commercial parking operations and the flow, and assess and characterize the heterogeneity of the urban freight operations and develop, finally develop a framework for effectively understand and classify the urban freight infrastructure network, including its usage, physical and temporal features. So let's go to the next section, which is the first one, mainly focused on commercial parking operations. As we discussed previously, there is a high competition for the curb, and on-street parking in particular is a scarce resource in urban area with many competitive demands for its use. Transit, micromobility uh, devices, TNCs, and passenger uh, dropping, um, passenger parking, for example, are all uh, in demand for that space. 
Um, as I mentioned before, that leads to commercial driver parking and also suitable locations or having uh, to circle back to find that, the right uh, place. The path of the lead review currently focus on passenger parking behavior, leaving uh, understudy of last mile segment. And when we think about freight, we usually uh, have been mostly thinking about mobility, but actually we also need to capture that accessibility aspect of this system. The urban space is the environment that the driver needs to navigate each day, and that includes the load and unload facilities. Even after the driver leaves the vehicle, he needs to navigate to city streets to, to give that final package. And that is actually um, um, impacting that dual time and the time, meaning the time is spent on the curb. So if we don't think about these stops and the connection to that final customer, then it's like, think about planning a trusting system where you didn't plan for bus stops. That is how we're deciding, um, how we're designing the system if we don't consider this section of the operation. However, at this point, most of the research uh, have been mostly uh, anecdotal, uh, and there's an effort to overcome. So there are um, a set of number of papers that have been trying to document uh, the challenges, parking choices, and behavior on the curb uh, for many of the commercial vehicles. For this part of the research, um, <clears throat> I, try, I try to answer, we were focusing on first, what are the characteristics of on-street commercial parking operations based on vehicle type? And second, what is the current uses of the commercial load and unload infrastructure? As I mentioned, there is a need for further empirical evidence about the variability of commercial parking, um, which is essential for current management strategies um, parking, and parking simulation tools, particularly related to three aspects. First, parking dual time. What factors affect the dual time, the use of the curb? Um, assess the current use of the dedicated load and unload infrastructure. Are we providing the right space in the right locations at the right size? Is it adequate parking? Because it's not only providing a number of spaces, but also are they they're, um, really going to be useful for the driver? And then the relationship between the land use and the heterogeneity of the commercial fleet. Because as I mentioned, we have a different sizes of vehicles, but also different types of operations. So each of them might have a different need of time and location where they need to uh, park to uh, finalize their operations. I must mention that this research is part, we not only focus on the curve, but also with my uh, coworkers, we also analyze uh, private loading areas and alleys, which are also part of the load and unload infrastructure. But for, for uh, the sake of time, and also only focusing on my own dissertation, I'm just gonna be focusing right now on the curve. But if you are interested in any of those papers, please feel free to follow with me. Um, so for the curb, we selected five different locations with five different categories of buildings. And for each of them, we define a three by three grid block uh, around each of the buildings in which we collected uh, three types of data. The time the commercial vehicles spend on the curb, meaning the dual time, where the commercial vehicle park, meaning the parking choice, and then the time non-commercial vehicles spend on the commercial vehicle loads. So answering that question of what is the current usage of the commercial infrastructure. So we use um, the this was an observation study that involved the use of human observers um, to collect the data on the field. And uh, we develop um, design, we, we develop a position system of collecting data. So if you remember the map previously, we have a three by three grid. So we um, established some positions in each of those uh, the data collectors where we're having a clear view to record each of the parking operations of interest in their assigned area, meaning the time precision defined in the study, which was a minute precision for each um, parking operation. And I'm going to go into detail, but uh, these are the type of features we collected, and it allows us to not only capture 
commercial vehicles versus passenger vehicles, for example, but we wanted, we were really interested in the granularity of those commercial fleets. So cargo bikes, delivery box trucks, delivery vans, delivery trailers, general vans, service vans were all part of the different categories that we capture. And then in the same way for granularity, when it goes to parking choice, we wanted to know exactly in what type of space they were parking, either a bus lane, a parking zone, intersection, a construction zone, passenger load zone, et cetera. At the end of the study, um, sorry, one of the premise of the study was to collect data during the morning peak of each building. And how do we define that? Uh, we had a previous study that take a look at each of those um, delivery operations inside the building. So how, that's how we establish the peak time for um, the freight operations. And except for the residential tower, which was not clear where um, the peak hour was. So we collected from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. At the end, we collected around uh, 1,816 1, on-street parking operations uh, for which 1,254 were from commercial vehicles. So just to clarify it again, if we want to clear before, we captured every single commercial vehicle that was parked in that three by three grid and every single vehicle that parked in that commercial load zone. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of the findings uh, for this study. And if you are interested of more of the findings or what else are we doing with the data, please feel free to also follow with me and but uh, here are some of the interesting findings. Um, most commercial vehicles were parked outside the commercial load zone. Again, we knew that we have some other total data, but we need the data to sustain policy. Um, so uh, based on the study that we gather overall for the five locations, we have a 41% of unauthorized parking. Only one third of commercial vehicles were in compliance uh, with the commercial load zones. At the same time, we found a lot of fluidity between passenger and commercial vehicles. Um, so we saw 26% of all commercial vehicles were, pass were parked in a passenger load zones. And just uh, for context, in Seattle, passenger load zones are three minutes uh, passenger load only areas. And then uh, of four commercial vehicles, 52% were passenger. And half of them had really fast operations in that area. So we, like, again, we saw that interchangeably uh, behaviors that are using uh, this space in a mix between passenger and commercial um, areas uh, and low down load zones. One thing that is really important to me to highlight when we're talking about the use of the curb, and I have discussed it a little bit earlier, is that freight operations also includes service vehicles, particularly in very dense area when we think about maintenance, plumbing, electrical services, IT, they all are providing ongoing maintenance on this service, particularly when we have a growth of urban towers in many of our urban areas. And uh, it's not only a small percentage of the urban freight, but as we can see, 36% of all commercial vehicles were service vehicles in the five locations. It's not only important that we know that distinguish between service and um, good delivery, um, but also this is really relevant because of how different their behaviors are. So service vehicles actually park for more than an hour, around 27 to 30%, and it depends on what specific location we're talking about. So having service vehicles park at the curb can really skew uh, the efficiency of that curb. And um, we can then really think about what is the different spectrum, what is the spectrum of the different commercial operations and how to allocate them better so we get the most efficient use of the curve. So this was one of the discussions that we found in our study of thinking about maybe service vehicles, how do we provide space outside the curve so uh, we can have a higher turn, turn our, uh, turnover at the curve space. Um, so let's go to the second uh, 
part of the, this of my um, research, which is gonna be focusing on urban commercial vehicle data collection and classification. Um, so transportation planners and decision makers often use origin destination surveys, commodity data, GPS-based data to estimate traffic flow and to develop and implement long-term freight plans and manage uh, the infrastructure. Current data collection methods capture urban freight volumes do not allow the complete picture of all the freight patterns in the city because they're usually spatially and temporal limited. And what I mean by that is that when you got, for example, origin destination surveys or commodity flow data or GPS-based data, you are um, depending on what company allows you to provide that information. And you might be just looking at one particular company, but you don't have that comprehensive picture of all the different vehicles and activities that are happening. So when we go, uh, when we think about vehicle classification using traffic flow data, it's, it's really an essential parameter of traffic management. We do want to understand how different traffic flow may be impacted depending on what vehicle we're talking about and how to better um, distribute it in the whole transportation network or how we can manage that demand. So volume data allows allows the analysis of traffic flow patterns on the local level and gives a better representation of actual traffic situation that results from the interplay between the travel demand and the supply characteristics. When we look at a different vehicle classification, one of uh, the main ones uh, is the Federal Highway Administration, the 13th axle uh, base. Sorry, I just saw a question. I'm not sure if I should leave the questions at the end or um, should I address them now? Chris, do let me know. Yeah, you can, we'll just, we'll handle all the questions at the end unless there's a clarification that you see. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, so we have the Federal Highway Administration 13 uh, axle base vehicle classification. Um, we only defined by the number of axles and it, it does define different uh, types of single trailers, uh, single unit trailers, sorry, single unit trucks, single, uh, single trailers and multi-trailers. But this uh, categorization is really hard to capture on the ground. Plus it also doesn't capture the type of activities they are performing. So when we go to research on urban planning, uh, um, planning policies or uh, studies led by the municipalities, um, we mostly only end up with a vehicle length or depending weight classification, depending on what area we analyzing, but, but uh, we got these really big groups of single unit trailers, uh, multi-trailer. Um, so, and currently there are, so, so we, don't have that 13 classification system um, for most of the research that we currently have. Although there are substantial uh, research efforts that aim to prove more robust and detailed vehicle classification methods, including the frequency of the loops that do require certain speeds for that vehicle to pass the loop. And you can review that frequency and uh, classify that vehicle, not only by trailer multi trailer, but maybe getting some information about what particular use of that vehicle, thinking about moving of livestock or refrigerator vehicles or construction vehicle, etc. Also um, image detection and other types of, uh, of technology are still being evaluated. And uh, particularly for the urban area, it might be hard. Uh, for example, the loops might not be as comprehensive located for the overall network and also um, uh, the speed that you need to be able to pass might not be ideal. Also we have a lot of visibility issues regarding uh, more visual techniques that uh, at, the, at the current moment um, don't allow us to differentiate for example a pickup from a van or a, a single unit truck from a step van or uh, etc. So recent studies have really revealed the significant void in the ability of more disaggregated data commercial activity for every section of the urban freight transportation network. 
So for this research, uh, we attend, we focus on answering two questions. The first one, how heterogeneous is a commercial fleet at the urban scale and what are the characteristics of commercial traffic flow at the urban scale and how does it differ for the general um, traffic? So how do I answer those questions? We implemented together with the city of Seattle, we established these two different locations. So we capture granular data on commercial vehicle movement traffic flow in two key areas. One, the greater downtown area, uh, and the other one is one of the two major industrial centers at Ballard Interbay in Seattle. The location selection comprehensively capture all major commercial traffic routes for each study area based on the uh, Seattle designation of the freight network and 42 location, 29 respectively. Video footage was captured for two days during the midweek, 24 hours per day for each location. And it was, the video uh, was processed by human observers capturing commercial traffic loads by day of the week, vehicle type, time of day, and directionality. And we got that in 15 minutes interval. Particularly, particularly for the greater downtown area, I developed and implemented um, a baseline cordon study for 39 vehicle entry access points to help the city understand not only when commercial vehicles are traveling in the greater downtown area, but what kind of commercial vehicles are going in or out of this area. For each section, only the legs that felt inside the cordon that we're seeing in the video right now were considered to capture inbound and outbound volume data. So for every single vehicle that we capture, uh, we classify in three different levels. We ended up having around 65 different categories. Uh, and we, it was several hours of video that we run to build a robust and replicable and comprehensive data collection. Um, the first level was to capture the vehicle body based on the vehicle frame. The vehicle usage, so what was the use of the vehicle and the number of axles. So to give you more context on that classification, uh, we have vehicle size. So think about your motorcycle, single unit, trailer, multi-trailer, RVs, et cetera. And then for vehicle usage, we have non-commercial and commercial categories, which include private and emergency for non-commercial and in commercial, we have goods transport, service, waste management, construction, and general in the case that we were not able to classify uh, between each other. So for example, think about your uh, white, typical, the typical white van that is moving through the city street that we don't really know what type of operation they might be performing. So just to give you a little bit of context, this is how in detail our typology went. So for every single commercial bounce or pickup category, for the service uh, vehicle type, we um, establish a manual for each of the human observers in order to help them uh, categorize if that vehicle was part of one category or another one. So for example, here, like we found like equipment or logos um, or other types of, um, um, of alterations that were put in the vehicle in order for us to really understood uh, what type of vehicle it was. And we tried to create a classification process as standardized as possible. So by the end, we, cause, we capture almost 150,000 commercial vehicles for the 48 hour period. For every single uh, 15 minute interval, the data was disaggregating, considering all the category uh, categorical levels that I'm showing here, including study area, roadway segment, direction, cordon direction um, regarding the inbound and outbound um, for, for the Great downtown area, because in the industrial area, we didn't do a cordon study, uh, body type, vehicle activity, and the number of axles. So again, for the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna be focusing on the main um, findings. 
So these are some interesting findings. Again, I want to highlight the importance of service vehicles. And here is showing some of the examples of what we consider service vehicles. And if you see good transport and service had almost the same um, percentage for the greater downtown area. And if you remember almost uh, between 27% of them for the service vehicle park an hour or more. So think about what is the impact of these really important share of vehicles in the curve. Another finding was that um, when we think about freight, we usually think about trucks, big heavy trucks. But really in urban areas, the data is showing us that most of those commercial vehicles are not trucks. In fact, 60% of them were smaller commercial fleet. And when I'm talking about the smaller commercial fleet, I'm talking about that uh, small run, those service pickups, those uh, delivery step bands that we're seeing from UPS or the smaller one that uh, we typically see in our neighborhood from Amazon. And this is not even in even consider those on-demand services uh, that I mentioned earlier. So your food delivery or your uh, on-time prime um, delivery um, either. One thing that really uh, that this data help us to do also is to evaluate the designation that Seattle has for its freight network. They classify it in major, minor, last mile connectors. Uh, depending on a different set of categories, including what is the volume that were observed in those routes. So when we uh, lay down that and compare it to the current classification, the findings seem to indicate that commercial traffic, um, all, actually, sorry, for 40% of all the, the, the evaluated location, and this is just showing, I think it's Ballard, yes, it's Ballard Interbay, location, 40% of them reporting more than double of the threshold that was defined um, by the Seattle Freight Network. And this is um, this makes sense because for the designation, they're only considering from single unit trailer, multi-trailer, but not the smaller fleet. So this really increased the volume um, of vehicles that were seen on the road. And also uh, aside from that, we were able to reevaluate the current designations and make some recommendations for particular locations that might need it to be in a higher classification designation or in a lower one. That's why you see the different colors because blue is major, minor is a green one. So for example, in the case of Emerson here, definitely should be considered a major truck route with the volume of trucks that we are seeing in that area. Um, and a final finding, um, major finding for this, uh, for this study was the importance uh, of really understanding that passenger vehicle and commercial are not showing the same behavior. So um, I guess most of you have been studying transportation or are transportation engineers. And when we think about traffic operations, we usually one of the first things we learn is about AM and PM peaks. And we know there is an important AM peak here for commuting and the same as PM peak for passenger. However, when we see commercial vehicles, it shows a very different behavior. We most, if not all location, um, take, uh, showing the peaks between eight to one PM. It seems like commercial vehicles utilize that spare capacity freed up by the decline of private vehicles between the AM and the PM commuter peaks. And that's what they take that time. And this also probably is um, impacted by the operations hours of the uh, businesses or customers that they need to serve during that mid time of the day. So let's go to the third section, which is talking about commercial um, vehicle traffic flow patterns in the urban space. This is based of the same database that I just discussed 
for the second section. And it, um, it's based on the idea that understanding the patterns of commercial movement in the urban environment is essential piece to develop and evaluate public strategies that aim to improve the efficiency and sustainability of the urban uh, freight system. And is the, the traffic flow patterns is a key information that we use in traffic operations to estimate transportation demand, forecast energy consumption, evaluate infrastructure condition, analyze safety risk. And it's a key information for modeling and simulation analysis. As I mentioned, we, we do have a lot of understanding for passenger daily profiles. And we understand that regular observation of traffic volume over years help us identify certain characteristics um, of and, and how it changed between different sections of the road from time to time. And this variation, we understand that that is repetitive and has a rhythm. And understanding these variations are really important to effectively serve, particularly the peak demand without having a breakdown in the system. When we go to commercial vehicles, we don't have a lot of information about those and how different they are from the different spectrum of commercial operations. So for these research questions, uh, I have established that I want to learn what are the typical weekday commercial traffic flow patterns present in urban road, roadway segments and how the roadway infrastructure and land use influence weekday commercial traffic flow patterns. And um, this is a head note. I, I'm currently working, this is a part that I'm currently working on and starting to do the analysis on. So I'm not gonna be presenting findings on these sections, just overall pre preliminary ones. And um, the, the logic behind our, um, my proposed analysis. So uh, one of the fundamental traffic flow characteristics is flow, also known as a flow rate, intensity, or volume. Basically, it's the number of vehicles traveling design a uh, unit of time. So uh, for, for these graphics here, I plotted an average weekday traffic profile linking uh, for an individual link based on two days of collected traffic data for each location. And here you can see uh, how for the Ballard interstate, uh, Interbay area, that is industrial area, it seems like there are um, more similar patterns in the different locations that we capture. In the greater downtown area, you see a lot of variation and that might make sense as the great downtown area is a bigger area. And also we have very different patterns from north to south to east to west. Um, so, I start looking at the data, like what is it showing, just like a visual inspection. And what I found very interesting uh, for the great downtown area is that if I cluster all each of the boundaries, so by north, east, west, and south, I start seeing some pattern forming uh, for each of the location. And remember that we, we can aggregate each of these uh, traffic flows by different types of variation, different sizes and directions. Here is just the overall uh, commercial share of traffic for each of the gateways. So for our research, um, I, I plan to leverage on the database that we put together for this project and use cluster analysis, which is an unsupervised learning method in the sense that we don't have uh, predefined classes because we really don't know what are the different sets of traffic flows for commercial vehicles. Consequently, by using cluster analysis, we can identify intrinsic grouping in unlabeled data set. So um, by using this unsupervised data mining method, we can discover what is a typical urban commercial traffic pattern and try to identify what vehicles and time relating features have the largest statistic uh, significant relevance in forming those traffic patterns. And the second idea is to follow that by a special exploratory analysis that I will be executing to determine the subset of, a, of attributes that demonstrate the highest correlation with this pattern. So not only based on that chip base of that traffic flow, but also considering in context of what is close to that area, what type of road are we evaluating? 
and what is the connectivity between the different elements. So basically we're talking really the data, the data set is a like georeference time series data. As we know what particular location it is and it's changing through time because we have that 50 minutes interval if for each 50 minute interval we do have a data collection of that particular um, georeference uh, position. So um, we, uh, we will be using this type of data. We can have your reference data or we can transform it by extracting different features of the ones we collected to describe that time series data. But basically uh, our research, I will use it, like I said, the data collected to evaluate three popular in, in tech, um, understandings that we have of traffic flow on road segments that, is, uh, that are. The first one, if road segment has a typical traffic flow. The second one, segments can be categorized and grouped into set of different clusters based on the similarity of the traffic uh, volume variations. And third, within each categories of cluster, row segment not only have similar traffic flow, but they're also similar in other characteristics, including, for example, geographical location, infrastructure related features or connectivity. So the research method that I'm currently implemented has four basic steps data processing to prepare the data for the analysis, then feature extraction, if we uh, decided to go chip-based or feature approach, and I can talk a little bit on that on the next slide. Um, the third one, cluster analysis, and the fourth, as I mentioned earlier, is that spatial exploratory data analysis. Once we have those clusters, how is that related to those um, spatial features? So for the feature extraction, for example, uh, we could play with the shape-based approach that is just your reference time series data, or we can extract and try to describe that time series with a different set of variables that we could use, for example, a P PCA to detect what of these variables may have more statistic significance or may explain better the changes in behavior. Uh, so for example, here is a list of the variables that I'm playing with, include peak hour, rate of increase, average of commercial um, share or share of commercial uh, small fleet, for example. So for the cluster analysis, we I have been doing a lead review to, to evaluate what potential clustering methods may be best for the data that we have collected. However, although clustering analysis have been used extensively in other disciplines, their use have been limited in the transportation engineering field. Uh, the, however, there is a growing interest in, in them in the recent years to increase the availability of detailed transportation, data, particularly with the increase that we've seen of detailed transportation data, big data, other sources of data that have been increasing, um, steadily increasing in the recent years. Um, in order to help us identify the needs for a scenario identification or simulation modeling uh, or analysis of transportation uh, data uh, to support decisions um, of urban policy. Trans um, so for the cluster analysis, um, we don't want to focus in on particularly on the estimation or prediction results, um, but try to understand more what patterns are and what spatial temporal traffic patterns uh, we can um, create knowledge on to, to get to provide that content or create that knowledge for urban policy and try to understand the spectrum of commercial vehicles that we currently don't have. So uh, based on our lead review right now, we have, uh, we are evaluating the data using k-means, hierarchical method, DB scan, which is based on density and spectral clustering. And each of those different have a set of pros and cons that we are still evaluating what makes more sense for our data. Uh, and also for each of those, we have to make decisions regarding what type of distance measure we'll be using to detect those clusters. Uh, some of them require, for example, k-means to know the number of um, clusters pre um, previous to the analysis. 
and the size of the number of clusters that we want. So here just a preliminary cluster results, but I just wanted to show how it might look like at the end. So for example, this is a hierarchical clustering dendrogram. It looks like a tree shape um, graphic, right? And it could help us classify, for example, this is a smaller area, the industrial man in the Ballar Interbay. And uh, right now just aggregating everything, just having one time series per location. Um, this is what we are seeing currently on the ground. So not only uh, clustering those locations, but also trying to understand especially um, what does that mean and what does that tell us and what the story is telling, what the data, what, what story is telling the data. Um, then we also run some k-means using dynamic time wrapping um, distance measures, because uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's very interested in that topic. I'm happy to follow with that. But basically, uh, DTB help us to get a more optimal um, clustering, and it do, does capture those really spikes between those 15 minutes interval that a and distance cannot detect. Uh, so here is like a first round of just k-means and trying to capture um, um, what locations and what will be a typical um, traffic flow for, for these different clusters. Well, I do the analysis, I must recognize different uh, limitations that we do have with the data. Um, just to mention, just gonna do it, um, gonna go through them really fast, not going into detail. Uh, but just gonna go like only variations of traffic uh, volumes are analyzed because we don't have travel time da uh, data. So the reliability of the travel time is not investigating in this um, dissertation. Um, this study does not capture vehicle movement after the vehicle crosses the graded uh, downtown cordon. So we don't have information about all the of the trip. Um, this effort cannot be considered comprehensive or complete count of all the city traffic because, as I mentioned before, the data is uh, just on the major truck route. So we have 39 gateways and that leaves some of the minor arterial or local streets out of the evaluation. And then short term variations due to traffic light cycles or short term dis uh, disturbance like offloading of a truck or bus stop are not analyzed. And finally, seasonal or long-term variations due to changes of land use patterns or infrastructural changes are not taken into account because we only have 48 hours of data for each location. So just to finalize, um, I'm putting here conclusions and contribution is a mix. Uh, like I said, I'm currently working on the final pieces of my dissertation on the analysis, particularly on the third section that I just uh, presented on. But uh, to finalize the presentation, I just want to share um, that based on these studies, we develop a replicable and transferable data collection method to both record commercial vehicle traffic behavior and granular commercial vehicle volumes and that we successfully uh, implemented in key key locations in Seattle, showing that diverse commercial vehicle demand, not only for low and low spaces, but how they distribute it in the transportation network. Um, this study gives the opportunity to revise existing parking policies regarding uses restriction, time restriction, space management, and rethink about where should vehicles be parked to do the most efficient way, uh, the, the most efficient use of the curb and the infrastructure that we're providing. Um, as those notes of the mobility of the different users of the network. It does offer a critical snapshot of detailed data that will allow the evaluation of different pre planning and transportation management strategies um, for, it, for both the curb and the, and, the, um, and the transportation network, including, for example, congestion pricing, infrastructure planning, or evaluating new uh, technologies. 
Um, the research displays an importance of providing tailored solutions that considers the spectrum of commercial vehicle fleets and their different operation needs. And uh, all the 3,740 hours of video coded data provide a helpful asset for future detection and image classification efforts for the future, the same as the model does. In fact, the city of Seattle is using the, the classification method that I developed for other data collections, um, not only related to freight, but in different, um, for different purpose. And we are creating knowledge with temporal variation uh, of, and typical within day traffic patterns for commercial vehicles in the urban area. And it's helping us to uh, identify temporal spatial similarities and dissimilarities between commercial vehicle flows and finding a framework in which we can summarize that in actionable way with pattern groups for urban uh, frame modeling and planning. And finally, recommend a level of granularities because we have 65 different categories, but we also want to know, like, do we really need all that? How different they are? Are they similar? So for example, think about construction and service, are they the same or they're different um, in order for cities to better evaluate the future of the data collection efforts and analysis and what potential technologies might provide the data that they need to detect those typical commercial patterns. Um, so with that, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and if you have any questions, either we have time today or you can follow with me later on too. I'll be happy to do that. All right, thank you for that interesting, comprehensive look at, 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 at freight and vehicle classifications. It brings back some good memories for me and some data analysis. Um, so if you were, we're we are going to extend the, the time a little bit on this seminar to get some questions in. Um, so if you want to type your question in the Q&A box, uh, please do that and we'll, we'll, we'll handle them. I want to I think I'm going to start with a question that, that isn't in the, the Q&A box because it I think your your work had me thinking about sort of the shifting of sort of urban freight vehicles from what we normally think of sort of like the single unit box truck to these you know variety of very different sized vehicles. So what do you think that means for some of those the cities that have the the freight plans in terms of what they were thinking in developing their freight plans, you have uh, thoughts about sort of how the changing vehicle mix might impact urban freight plans. Yes. So, for example, like for the city of Seattle, we were, um, it was really important for them and they were using this data to showcase that, to show that it's not only trucks. So she knew that the language that we're using is not only trucks, but all these different set of uh, vehicles. And I think there's a change in the municipality. And even though I only mentioned four cities, for example, uh, New York is also um, just released, I think it was the end of last year, the beginning of this year, talking about just last mile um, operations. And for example, for me now working in the city of Portland for Pivot, we are extending that definition to what is actually freight and including a, an important chunk of those operations include that last mile and smaller vehicle fleets. In fact, thinking about the smaller vehicle fleet, it might be sometimes easier depending on the conditions um, to, to go to more electric vehicles or reduce emissions or um, solve some of the operations instead of having really big heavy vehicles, having a smaller fleet for the local street or smaller deliveries might be better for, um, for, for reducing emission, congestion, safety, safety issues. Um, so really not neglecting, but highlighting the importance of them and considering as a big important section. Um, the same for load and unload. I think there's have been a really increase and in, uh, in focus on curve management and what what different use users of the curve are and how TNCs of on-demand services might be a really important users of that curve. And I do see that change in how we talk in this in the seminars that we're seeing, how cities are approaching, the conversation that we're internally having at Pivo too is definitely changing when we compare to the previous, for example, the freight plan, the same as Seattle is doing. Thank you. 
in the new hotel. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, I have a question also that is um, not in the Q&A box here. Um, so you mentioned that um, in terms of looking at who is utilizing the curb space, that um, people were pretty liberally using the passenger and commercial loading zones, um, just in whichever type of vehicle they're in. And I was wondering if you saw any differences in uh, maybe different cities or different situations where there might be um, differences in how enforced those zones might be. And, might that also contribute to maybe some uh, policy recommendations that um, you think might be helpful to um, kind of separate those zones uh, for different users? Yeah, so we don't have a lot of data. So looking into my research, like trying to find other studies that had that type of data was hard. San Francisco, New York have done some really great studies and they have found similar um, findings that, that we find, um, sorry for the redundancy, but that we found in our Seattle studies, having that like interchangeably of fluidity between uh, both of the users. Uh, for example, the, the city of Portland right now is implemented a study of uh, five minute fast stops. And it's not only allowing drop off a of passenger, but also like fast deliveries. And that's how I see things changing, that we think about more the dual time and type of operation instead of having these trucks and passenger vehicles. But thinking about uh, the dual time and where those these operations, how close they need to happen to their final destination. So maybe we can have a mix of things. So like fast, flexible spaces for really short operations and then having like really long dual times outside of the curb so we liberate that space. And I do see that in Europe and other municipalities that are thinking about that mix of spaces instead of having these different sets of modes, thinking about the characteristics of that operation instead of just thinking about passenger transit or freight. Okay, uh, a question uh, about your maybe now at your work on Peabot. Does P do you, are you does Peabot and the freight and the freight area sort of coordinate with the development services to increase um, decrease the square footage of loading zones in front of large buildings? So I cannot answer that question right now. What I will say is that we're working with PBS. Um, thinking about that loading and unload. So instead of just thinking of the curb as one piece completely independent, start thinking about we have a set of capacity and infrastructure that could be alleys of on street, uh, the curb or off street, meaning inside the building or like parking lots. And how do we get the most capacity and the most efficient use of them. So we are right now in current conversations with BPS and how we can do that better and work uh, between different bureaus um, to provide that space that is needed using those three different sections of the load and load infrastructure. Great, and I, I see that uh... I think you've answered the other questions that are in the, the Q&A panel. Did want to point out that there is a, a, a comment that says, love your research. So that's always, uh, that's, that's great. Welcome, welcome to Portland. We're excited to have you um, here in the city working with us on freight. And uh, thank you for your great presentation. Um, if you're um, this, so we're gonna wrap up the seminar. If you, uh, uh, we, we, and we will, uh, the seminar will be posted along with the slides uh, shortly after the, after the, after we conclude today. So, and you will get, uh, if you're, if you're registered on the seminar, you'll get a short survey. We'd appreciate you if you would, if you would complete that survey for, for feedback for us. So with that, and as a reminder, there's no, uh, no seminar next Friday due to the, due to the holiday. So the last seminar will be December 3rd. So with that, uh, signing off. Have a great weekend. And thanks again, Gabriella. Thank you so much for your time.